Well, our Bible reading today from Habakkuk is Habakkuk chapter 3. Uh, you'll find a copy either on your screens or in the service sheets if you've printed them off or in your Bibles. I'm going to read to us from Habakkuk chapter 3. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to Shigianoth. Lord, I've heard the report about you. Lord, I stand in awe of your deeds. Revive your work in these years. Make it known in these years. In your wrath, remember mercy. God comes from Timon, the Holy One from Mount Paran, Salah. His splendor covers the heavens and the earth is full of his praise. His brilliance is like light and rays are flashing from his hand. This is where his power is hidden. Plague goes before him. Pestilence follows in his steps. He stands and shakes the earth. He looks and startles the nations. The age-old mountains break apart. The ancient hills sink down. His pathways are ancient. I see the tents of cushion in distress. The tent curtains of the land of Midian tremble. Are you angry at the rivers, Lord? Is your wrath against the rivers? Or is your rage against the sea when you ride on your horses, your victorious chariot? You took the sheath from your bow. The arrows are ready to be used with an oath. Salah. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains see you and shudder. A downpour of water sweeps by. The deep roars with its voice and lifts its waves high. Sun and moon stand still in their lofty residence. At the flash of your flying arrows. At the brightness of your shining spear. You march across the earth with indignation. You trample down the nations in wrath. You come out to save your people, to save your anointed. You crush the leader of the wicked and strip him from foot to neck. Salah. You pierce his head with his own spears. His warriors storm out to scatter us, floating as if ready to secretly devour the weak. You tread the sea with your horses, stirring up the great waters. I heard and I trembled with him. My lips quivered at the sound. Rottenness entered my bones. I trembled where I stood. Now I must quietly wait for the day of distress to come against the people invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud and there is no fruit on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Yahweh, my Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like those of a deer and enables me to walk on mountain heights for the choir director on stringed instruments. This is the word of the Lord. But you've got an outline there and I'll be working my way through that. Uh, There's an opportunity for you to take notes and hopefully, depending on how the technology works, uh, there'll be an opportunity for you to email or post questions or comments or feedback based on what you've heard and understood today. Well, who here would have predicted three, five, six months ago that the key issue that we would now all be facing would be how do we wait? Uh, In essence, that's what we're facing as a wider society, uh, smaller communities, as families, individuals and workers. We're we're all just waiting. Uh, We really don't know what we're waiting for. We don't know how long we're waiting Uh, We don't know the kind of society that will emerge on the other end. And wherever you look on websites, newspaper articles, television shows, any type of media, uh, there is advice on how to wait, on what waiting should look like. Uh, One line of advice is to get busy uh, so that there's not too much downtime, not too much opportunity to think how pear-shaped the world has gone. Uh, It doesn't matter how you are occupying yourself, just get busy so you don't think about the state of the world. Another line of advice is to take advantage of the enforced and imposed quiet time. To take the moment to wait in reflection, to spend time resting, to spend time considering what's necessary and what's not. A further line of advice is to use this waiting time to better yourself, to learn a new skill, to try something different, to develop a hobby or an interest, to achieve those things that you've always planned to do but never had time to indulge. But behind all this advice is one key question. How do we wait? Uh, It's a key question because in general, we don't wait well, do we? Not in this time and place. 
Uh, we often exist as a society and individuals with no concept of waiting, uh, with a sense of the immediate. Just take those two simple examples of drive through takeaway and credit cards. Uh, as a society, we have lost the idea of delayed gratification. Our whole culture is not built around waiting. Our whole culture is built around now and me. Well, Habakkuk's waiting. Uh, when we first met him five or six weeks ago, he was waiting, waiting for an answer from God. And then as he asked questions, he waited some more. And now having heard the Lord's response to his questions, he seems to finally begin to grasp how to wait well. And today we're going to listen to what he has to say about waiting well on the Lord. Let me pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your word. I thank you that we can read it. Thank you that we can do it while we're waiting. And we pray that you'll work in us by your spirit to make us your people who wait well. I'm at point two on the outline. Habakkuk's been on a remarkable journey. He began with why. He could not understand how God could possibly fulfill his promise to deal with the sin of the whole world when the very people that he'd chosen to use, Abraham's family, were so rebellious. Uh, they'd been rendered ineffective in their job. Their job was to represent God to the world so that the world would know him. They'd been rendered ineffective in that job by their evil and wayward and stubborn hearts. Uh, as a nation now reduced to Judah, that southern kingdom of two tribes centered around Jerusalem, as a nation, they'd driven Habakkuk to despair and lament. He could not stop crying out to the Lord, how long, why? What are you going to do about this? Well, the Lord had responded by revealing his plans, and they were astounding plans. God would deal with the sin of his people by bringing judgment. He was raising up the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, the most violent and bloodthirsty superpower of the time, to bring that judgment through invasion and exile. God was raising them up for this very purpose. And that enabled us to place this book within history. Habakkuk was probably working around 610 to 605 BC. And God had form in this area. He'd already dealt with the northern kingdom of his people, Israel, with its capital at Samaria through the violence of Assyria. And God's people in the south had seen God's patience and judgment just over the border. But Judah persisted in their evil. Habakkuk persisted too. The Lord's answer had troubled him even more. And now he was grappling with the way to reconcile the nature of God with the method of God. God, I know you are like this, so why are you doing that? Put simply, if God is the unique, eternal, pure Lord of the whole universe who cannot stand evil in his presence, how could he possibly use the Babylonians to judge his own people? Moreover, what did that mean for the salvation of the world, which was to come through Abraham's family if they themselves were wiped out? Habakkuk knew that the Lord would answer. Habakkuk also knew that the answer of the Lord would create the need for him to change his own life. And the Lord did answer, didn't he? His answer was for his people across the generations. It needed to be written down. It needed to be waited for. His words would come true, but in his time, in his power, the Lord did answer, and when he answered, he painted a picture of humanity. Uh, on the one hand, the wicked, the crooked, the, in, the, the people who were sinful, uh, those who were destined for judgment to taste their own medicine, destined to face God's anger, the Babylonians and the wicked amongst God's own mob. And on the other hand, there were the righteous, those living in line with God's design, those who hear God, who take him at his word and live like it, those who wait for God to do exactly as he promised. In essence, the righteous live life with the Lord in his rightful place, at the centre, as the most significant person in all the universe. Habakkuk had asked why. Habakkuk had been commanded to wait, and now he is waiting. How does he show us how to wait well? On that point three on the outline, the last chapter of Habakkuk, that chapter that we just read, is remarkably different to the rest of his prophecy. Uh, the difference is very clear in the first and the last verse, verse 1 and verse 19. 
a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to Shigianoth for the choir director on stringed instruments. As Habakkuk writes these words, this is the response of the changed life. Remember Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 1. Here is Habakkuk's reply to the Lord's answer. And it's a striking response. It's a prayer. That in itself is an expression of dependence, isn't it? Of taking God at his word, of living like it, of having God in the right place in life. It's the life of the person who trusts God because prayer is a fundamental declaration of dependence. Prayer is not about independence. Prayer is not about cooperation. But prayer is taking God at his word as the most significant person in the universe and stating your dependence upon him. It's so different to the arrogant, sinful human who's a lone ranger and thinks that they're better at being God than God himself. It's a community prayer. Did you catch that in the last verse? It's for the choir director. And forgive me if I'm wrong, but choirs very rarely sing without an audience or outside community. It's to be sung when the people of God physically gather. Won't that be a great day? It's to be sung as they're gathered together in a mob. And again, it's an action of a person of faith. To trust God, to do as he says, to live like God will do as he promises, to be in community with God and to be in community with his mom. Again, it's so different to the arrogant and crooked and sinful person. Their actions are always self-serving, always independent, always at the expense of community because they alone are God. So how does Habakkuk wait well? He waits well by waiting in dependent community. And then he unpacks what that looks like as a community. And the first part of waiting is remembering. Look there in verse 2. Lord, I've heard the report about you. Lord, I stand in awe of your deeds. Habakkuk can wait because he knows his history. He's heard the report about the Lord. He knows what the Lord has done and what the Lord is capable of doing. He knows that the Lord has displayed his faithfulness in his actions, shown his character in his deeds. That's very important for Habakkuk's waiting. It explains how he approaches the Lord. He knows the Lord's promises. He knows the Lord's actions. And so he's confident in bringing his questions to the Lord. Moreover, as the Lord answers him, Habakkuk has the history of the Lord's dealings with the universe firmly entrenched in his mind as a backdrop. In fact, that history fills Habakkuk with awe. He's heard of the Lord's utter consistency in doing as he said, so that he can only stand dumbstruck at how wonderful God is in his consistency. The Lord's reply to his last lament has taken him back into that awesome history of the Lord's work in this world and he's reassured and awestruck. Doesn't move into silence though, does he? Not completely. Because you'll notice that in verse 2 he moves from this remembering to requesting, revive your work in these years, make it known in these years, in your wrath remember mercy. Habakkuk is a student of the work of the Lord, but he's not yet experienced that in front of his very eyes in his own time and place, in the way that he knows it has happened in the past. And so he brings a request to the Lord as he stands amidst the judgment wrought by the Babylonians. He asks the Lord to revive your work. But it's not just a general statement. You'll notice there at the end of verse 2 that there is some flesh on these bones. In your wrath, remember mercy. Habakkuk has heard of the Lord walking with Adam and Eve after their sin. Habakkuk has heard of the Lord lamenting the state of the world, bringing judgment and wiping it out and preserving Noah and his family on the boat. Habakkuk has heard of the Lord giving Abraham a son and showing him the land, even though Abraham was a man who was hasty and took matters into his own hands too often. Habakkuk has heard of the Lord passing over Egypt, bringing his people out at the same time as he brought a massive and horrible judgment on the nation of Egypt. 
Habakkuk has heard of the Lord giving his people the land he promised even after they'd wandered for 40 years in the desert because they were stiff-necked and hard-hearted. In each, the judgment of the Lord has highlighted the mercy of the Lord, his undeserved generosity to people who deserve his judgment. In each, the Lord's wrath against human sin goes hand in hand with his unbelievable grace and kindness to those who are sinners. And as he stands and waits in the middle of this judgment, Habakkuk cries out to the Lord, Lord, in your wrath, remember mercy. Please do as you've promised in dealing with sin in both judgment and grace. And as he does wait, remembering, requesting, he also recalls. Verses 3 to 15 are kind of like a greatest hits of history, uh, raising and touching on all the great moments that the Lord has done and acted across all of time as Habakkuk recalls what God has done. But it's more than just a recognition of what the Lord has done in the past. He weaves together a three-verse song in such a way that it touches on all these great moments of the Lord's action in the past and then brings them forward into the present and looks towards the future. The snapshot comes in three verses. Each verse has a title, a line that finishes with the word Salah, and then that title is unpacked in the lines that follow. The overall impression is to strike us with the same awe that Habakkuk feels as he remembers what the Lord has done, recalls what he's done in the past. It's a picture of the Lord coming to do what he's promised and it has an amazing effect on the very physical fibre of the universe as the Lord deals with sin through the family of Abraham. The first verse begins in verse 3. It's the title. God comes from Tim and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Salah. A fairly tame title. When you look at it, God comes. However, when you see how that coming is described in the lines that follow, you can't avoid the awe. It's kind of like someone saying, oh, there was a dust storm the other day. And then you see a footage of one of those dust storms and you realise how awesome it is. The description of the Lord coming is awesome and awe-inspiring. It dwarfs the universe. It's written in a massive display across the skies. It shakes the roots of mountains. It overturns the gatherings of human beings. When the Lord comes, it's unlike anything that's ever happened ever before. The second verse of this greatest hits begins in verse 9, and that's the title for that verse. You took the sheath from your bow. The arrows are ready to be used with an oath. Salah. It's a more personal note here. Did you notice that? A movement from God to you. Uh, God is coming. He's coming with the weapons of divine warfare. Uh, Again, the image is awe-inspiring. But I think what we need to notice more clearly here is the way in which the coming of the Lord has an effect on the very physical nature of the universe. Each phrase mentions the physical impact of the Lord coming on his creation. The very things that we humans see as said and established and immovable, the very things that we see as beyond our control and too massive to move, these very things are dwarfed and diminished by the coming of the Lord. The coming of the Lord will affect the very fibre of this created world. The third verse begins in verse 13, and that's the title for that verse. You Come out to save your people, to save your anointed. You crush the leader of the house of the wicked and strip him from foot to neck, Salah. This is where the greatest hits lands as Habakkuk shows us the ultimate purpose of the Lord's coming. The Lord comes to save his people. That's what Habakkuk is waiting to see. When the Lord comes to do as he promised, on a grand scale, to deal with the sin of his people, through the family of Abraham, which will have an impact on the whole world. Well, that snapshot, that greatest hit song in three verses, produces a remarkable reaction in Habakkuk. Just look at verse 16. I heard and I trembled within. My lips quivered at the sound. Rottenness entered my bones. I trembled where I stood. Now I must quietly wait for the day of distress to come against the people invading us. 
The snapshot has caused Habakkuk, I think, to finally grasp who he's waiting upon and the absolute magnitude of the nature of the Lord who is coming. And as he grasps that vision and as it works in him, I think he gets a vision of himself that reduces him to brokenness, that makes him know the rottenness in his own self. As he gets an image of the greatness of the Lord coming, he knows the nature of his own sin. And it reduces him to a level of fearful reverence before the Lord that is appropriate. If that is the Lord, what else can we humans do but quiver and feel rotten in our own bones? If that is the Lord who is coming, what else can we do but wait for him to do what he has inevitably promised. If that is the Lord who is coming, what else can we do but know the truth that he will do as he desires and as he has spoken. And it brings him to a great rejoicing in the Lord in a context of great desolation. Look at verse 17. Though the fig tree does not bud and there is no fruit on the vines, Though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stores, yet I'll triumph in the Lord. I'll rejoice in the God of my salvation. The view that Habakkuk has in front of him is a view that is desolate. It's a view of a scorched earth that is unproductive and the crops are withered and empty. The stables and the stockyards are eerily quiet and dusty. The world that he knows has been decimated by the judgment brought by the Lord, by the war that has been wrought by the Babylonians. It's a profoundly depressing and desolate view. But in the midst of that desolation, Habakkuk knows this truth. The Lord will do as he promises. The Lord is for those who take him at his word and live like it. As he waits, he knows from remembering, requesting, recognizing, revering. As he waits in community and prayer with those faithful few who still take the Lord at his word and live like it, Habakkuk knows that the Lord will save him because the Lord does exactly as he promises and he rejoices. That's profoundly out of step with society around him, isn't it? It's in stark contrast to those in the world around him. On the one hand, there are the arrogant who are taking what is not theirs. On on another level, there are those who are endlessly restless because they think they are doing a better job than God. And then there are those who are under the judgment because of their sin. All around him, the landscape is desolate and depressing and scorched and empty and the smells and the tastes and the sounds of judgment are around him and he rejoices. It's a deep-seated satisfaction that the Lord will do exactly as he says. Amidst all that death and desolation, this is a lie. God's word will take place. How? Habakkuk doesn't know when. He doesn't know the time or the occasion. But he does know this. The Lord will do as he says. And Habakkuk takes him at his word. And lives like it, rejoicing. And as he does rejoice, as he stands amidst that wreckage, as he watches his people go out into exile, he states very clearly who he relies upon. Look at verse 19. Yahweh, my Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like those of a deer and enables me to walk on mountain heights. I don't think I grasp the significance and the wonder of those words in these circumstances now. You have to vividly imagine what is going on around him at that moment and the movement in his own life from chapter 1 through to here. Around him there are feet trudging off in sadness and mourning, trudging off into exile, leaving behind a landscape that has been destroyed under judgment. And amidst all of that, as those feet trudge off, around him everywhere, the judgment of God 
Habakkuk prays with God's mob and says, I rely upon the Lord. As everything else sags and droops and is sapped around him, as those feet scuff in the dust off into Babylon, their feet, the feet of those who take the Lord at his word and live like it, those feet will climb to the heights of the mountains, will be sure-footed, will never slip because they know this one truth. The Lord will always do as he promises. Put simply, Habakkuk gets on with life because he knows the Lord will do as he said. He will deal with sin through Abraham's family. At this point, before we go on any further, I want us to notice in particular where the reliance of Habakkuk lies. It's not on the fact that he is a worthy volunteer. It's not on the fact that he has a selfless care for those around him. It's not based in his community-minded attitude or his ability to just plow on and plow through. His reliance isn't established on his ability to pull together with like-minded individuals to see the best in things, to make lemonade when the world hands you lemons. His reliance is on none of those things, is it? His reliance is in one thing, one person, the Lord, who is committed to doing what he says and so is committed to his very own people. That will never fade. That will never fail. It will never rescind or retire or wilt. The Lord will always deliver on what he has promised. That's an amazing change in Habakkuk, isn't it? That point four on the outline. Here is the man of why who is now waiting, and as he waits, he gives the Lord what he deserves, the worship, the reverential fear. Uh, in this community prayer, this group expresses around Habakkuk their dependence upon the Lord. They remember and request and recall and revere and rejoice and rely. We don't know if Habakkuk saw the day of distress to come against the people invading us, but he knew it would come, and so it did. Babylon was destroyed by Persia in 539 BC. The wicked of God's people had been judged by the wicked of Babylon. The wicked of Babylon were judged by the wicked of Persia, and so it goes on. And the remains of God's people, the descendants of Abraham, returned to that land they had left in 538 BC. If you know your history, you will know that that's as good as it got for a very long time. Now, it was a pale imitation of what God's people had once enjoyed, what they had hoped for, even what they had left behind. And yet the Lord's word remained clear. God will deal with sin through Abraham's family. You come to save your people, to save your anointed. Habakkuk's recognition (coughs) remained. And so the faithful waited. And they waited. They waited. And they waited. And then there is an account of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of of Abraham. As Matthew begins his biography of Jesus Christ with those words, you're meant to be jolted awake because the family of Abraham remains. And as you find out, as you read, it's been narrowed down to this one man anointed at his baptism, Matthew 3, confirmed in his testing, Matthew 4, revealed as the one that the Lord had promised as he proclaims that the kingdom of God is coming, Matthew 4, 17. His actions are amazing. They change the very physical nature of the world around him. He's anointed again at his revealing on the high mountain, Matthew 17. He enters the capital of the Lord's people as a king, Matthew 21. He lives in a landscape where the fig tree does not blossom and it is barren, Matthew 28, verse 18. He's continually waiting for the moment when the Lord will do as he says for the right time. And so as Jesus kneels and prays in the Garden of Gethsemane, in what looks like a dependent community. As he surveys the world around him, the world in the darkness of night and sin and broken and damaged, as he looks at his own landscape and sees it dominated by the carp of the Lord's wrath against all human sin, 
Jesus Christ states his complete dependence upon the Lord, upon the God who has said he'll deal with sin through Abraham's feet. Jesus is deserted and alone, bereft. He states clearly that the will of God is his desire. And at that moment, he says he depends upon the Lord alone. At that moment, Jesus is the man of faith who will live, though we do not know how. He dies an astounding death. All creation is damaged and affected. The mighty are astounded as the power of Rome and the Jewish people meet the power of the Son of God. Sin is judged and it is finally dealt with through Abraham's family in an astounding way. And then three days later he rises, raised by the Lord to show that the word of the Lord has been achieved. Creation itself is changed as Jesus walks around with a new body, a glimpse of what will be one day. And the Lord has done what he promised. And when you look back on his life, this man Jesus was the living embodiment of the very prayer that Habakkuk prayed as he waited. Jesus remembered and recognized and revered the great works and words of the Lord. He requested that the Lord deliver mercy and judgment, that the Lord's will be done. He revered the Lord, always obeying him. He rejoiced in what the Lord provided in relying upon the will and plan of the Lord alone. Habakkuk's why led to waiting and then worship as he looked for the certain time when the Lord would do as he promised. He lived as a man of faith. Jesus is the man of faith. The descendant of the family of Abraham who does everything that Jesus, that God promised. Jesus is the Lord come into the world. Jesus is the one who has come to save his anointed by crushing his enemy, which is sin and death. Let me remind you of what Paul says when he begins his letter to the Christians in Rome. We read it a few weeks ago, Romans 1, 16 to 17. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. I'm at point five on the outline. If we take Jesus at his word and live like it, if we are people who trust and in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus, God has done exactly as he promised, dealt with human sin, with our sin, with my sin, in an astounding way, then we will live. We will be people who God declares to be in line with his design, because he did exactly as he promised. This then is the life of the person of faith, who waits well, knowing that the Lord has already done what he promised through the family of Abraham, dealt with our sin in an astounding way, and will do as he promises, bring all things to an end. How do we wait well then? There's nothing original about this. Just look back at Habakkuk's prayer and the way in which Jesus is Habakkuk's prayer. And you'll gain a glimpse of the waiting well kind of life, a life in which the Lord is where he belongs, where we take him at his word. Let me give you three practical suggestions as a way of finishing. And I hope you notice how different they are to the three lines of advice we received at the start. First, never forget, that the Lord's people wait well, independent community. We may not be gathered physically. We might not be seeing each other physically. But God's design for the community to be gathered physically still remains. And nothing we experience now changes that design. Please continue to wait in community for the community to be physically gathered again, dependent upon the Lord in all things. As we do that, nurse and nurture the habit of community in our own little households of meeting together in a physical way under the constraints we've got at the moment. Look for ways to nurture that habit of community within your own households, within your own means. 
It might be using the parish address book to pray for a different person each day. It might be to use the parish address book to ring people and to talk to them about a part of the Bible you've read and pray with them over the phone. It might be to use the parish contacts to send a letter, to send an email or a text message, to write or draw a Bible verse and post it to someone in order to encourage them. But let me encourage you. God's people wait well in dependent community. As we wait for our physical gathering to be together again, wonder, just as the Lord designed, please think carefully about how to nurture and nurse the habit of community in your own homes. Secondly, in community, as a larger community, when we can gather in the community of our own households, even as individuals in community with the Lord, please use the template of Habakkuk's song to wait well, remembering, requesting, recalling, revering, rejoicing, relying. Perhaps this week, over six days, as you read your Bible, you can use a different one of those R words to think about what you've read or to write a prayer in response to what you've read. Perhaps over six weeks, you could use an R word per week to structure your meditations on God's word or the way in which you communicate with those within God's people. Or perhaps, perhaps, to use one of those R words to introduce others to the Lord we're waiting to return. Finally, let me suggest to you that to wait well is to read well. It seems to me that as I've considered what Habakkuk does as he waits well, as I've looked at the biographies of Jesus as he waits well, they knew the Lord because they knew his word. Here is the key to waiting well. To know the Lord through the Lord's word. To know the Lord through the Lord's word. Now is as good a time as any to get into the habit of reading the Lord's word to know him. So that we can know that he has a habit of doing what he promises. That he dealt with sin in an astounding way through Abraham's family. And that the end will come. And we are to wait well for it. Let me pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that you've given it to us so that we can know you and so that we can know the one who came to save us from our sins. Father, help us to nurture the community of your people as we wait to be physically gathered again. Father, help us to follow the pattern of Habakkuk's waiting will in his poem and song. And Father, help us to know you well by knowing your word well. In your name we pray. Amen.